Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to this latest uh, session of the seminar on contemporary Marxist theory, which is based at King's College London, but involves a transnational network of Marxist scholars and researchers. Uh, and today we're talking about the left ecology and degrowth. Now, this is a very hot topic, uh, partly for the obvious reason that what we're confronting is something almost unfathomable because it's so outside the bounds of human experience with the rise in, in temperatures that is going on and all the consequences that that generates. And the question is, how do we, as a left, how will we define our, that left, address climate change, and, of course, relatedly address the blind process of capital accumulation that's driving it? Now, just this morning, I was reading an article in the Financial Times about the Chinese economy, and it started off by quoting President Xi Jinping's new slogan is develop new qualitative forces. And rather dismissively, the Financial Times says that this formula is rooted in 19th century Marxist thinking. But it does present one way of approaching the problem of, of climate change, which the Chinese state is in its own way trying to address which is essentially to rely on the productive forces, on the further development of the right kind of productive forces, let's put it like that, in order to achieve um, a, a decarbonized e economy. But there's a very powerful alternative view, view with an increasingly influential ones on the left, which is summed up by the slogan of degrowth communism, you know, which it, um, identifies the development of the productive forces as central to the problem we face and something that we ca can no longer rely on. For example, Kohai Saito, who spoke at this seminar a few years ago, uh, published a book called Slow Down, which advocates deep growth communism that sold half a million copies in Japan and is, has now been published in English. But I, whatever stand, moreover, whatever stand we take on this, um, what kind of political strategy do we pursue to achieve break? Now, we've got four great speakers to address this set of questions. And I'm simply going to, I could say a lot about all of them, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to say where they're based. First of all, Faisi Ismail, who's based at Goldsmiths University of London. Um, Kin Chai Lao of Lingnan University in Hong Kong, and we're particularly grateful to her because it's midnight in Hong Kong. So she's made a particular effort to, uh, sorry, got the order wrong. There's also Kai Heron from Lancaster University. And finally, Matt Huber from the other end of the time zones at Syracuse. Hughes University in the United States. And the speakers are going to speak in the order that was advertised, that Spacey first, then Kai, then uh, Kin Chi, then, uh, and finally, finally Matt. And they'll each speak for 10 or 12 minutes, and I'll tell them when they've reached 10 minutes. Uh, after they've all spoken, after we have the presentations, we will then have a question and answer. The speakers will add to the to the to the questions. Then we'll have a further further rounds of questions, more replies by the speakers until we exhaust ourselves and the time available. So that's how the seminar seminar will run. 
Okay, so without holding things up any any further, let's get started. Firstly, with Faisy. Faisy, so do you want to get us going? Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And um, thanks to Diego and Lucia and the organizers of the of the seminar. Um, I, I want to start with uh, Palestine and the ongoing genocide in Gaza, first because it can be no business as usual while these war crimes are taking place, while we witness the, the horror unfolding on our screens day after day. Second, because the billions that are spent on arming Israel uh, makes Western governments both complicit in war crimes, but also irresponsible and unaccountable. Every pound spent on weapons is not spent on welfare, which is in decline in the middle of a cost of living crisis. But it also means less investment in climate policies. The prime minister in Britain has recently rolled back progress on, on climate policies in an attempt to attack the ostensible opposition over budgetary concerns, even though that ostensible opposition has actually followed suit. But we know that poll after poll um, shows that the public would prefer the government to do more rather than less on the climate front. Uh, but third, we've seen an absolutely huge global upsurge in mobilization against Israeli aggression and Western complicity, which is largely unprecedented. Millions of people have been out on the streets now for almost six months, protesting, occupying, shutting things down, and Palestine is everywhere. And I think, you know, many in the climate movement long for this to be the case over the climate crisis, um, but that hasn't happened yet. And we need to keep returning to the reasons why. So in this context, building and intensifying mass mobilizations over the issues that people are already fighting over, in this case, Palestine, in every country and in every possible way could start to influence the fight for the climate. One, because at a fundamental level, it is the same ruling classes who are committing war crimes against Palestinians as are committing violence against the planet. Um, but two, the central question is one of power, uh, imperialist power um, and the way power is wielded. And any movement that asserts popular power effectively by implication raises, at least raises um, that, that question. So this is an argument for an overarching strategy that can win. One that has the climate as a central pillar, but is focused on changing the system that gave rise to the climate crisis. And I think there is common ground with uh, proponents of um, the most left-wing version of degrowth, that crisis is driven by, by the capitalist system of production, that uh, the prime motive uh, of that system is profit, under which everything else, including human need, is subsumed, and that working people need collective control of production in order to, to decide on a democratic basis what should be produced and how it should be produced. The core of the debate is a strategic sense of how to get there. And here I think degrowth is sorely lacking. Uh, but, but prior to the strategy is, is the analysis. And, and for me, at least three issues stand out. First is that the primary lens that much of degrowth analysis deploys is this geography of the global North and South rather than class as the dominant framework. So Kohei Saito can argue that the working class in the global north not only have an imperial mode of living, uh, but that they exploit uh, others in the global south. And that the current capitalist order of society appears attractive and comfortable for a wide range of groups in the global north, while the real costs are imposed on the global south. So effectively, um, that the global north um, has to degrow, while the suggestion is that uh, change will come from the global south. I think this is a misreading of the condition of the working class in the global north. It 
tends to dismiss uh, the poverty, inequality, food banks, uh, stagnating wages and so on in, in the global north. And so it misunderstands the way neoliberalism has attacked the working classes over the past four decades, such that inc increasingly uh, they reflect the economic conditions of workers in the global south. This is the effect of uh, decades of stagnating wages. But it also lets the ruling classes off the hook. And it discounts or even dismisses the struggles that working people are engaged in, essentially rejecting the idea of a global working class that can find solidarity uh, in struggle um, against the capitalist class. So a global working class against a, a, a global capitalist class, if you will. And that um, dismissing that is dangerous because it suggests that the dividing line in society is to be found amongst the working classes when the real task is how to overcome barriers to solidarity in order that people can build the confidence to fight back on a collective basis. Second, I, I don't think that we can argue that being critical of degrowth means eco-modernism, um, or indeed that being a socialist means not paying attention to ecological questions. If we ask the question, can we have degrowth that is, sorry, can we have growth that is progressive and sustainable? We have to be able to do this, even while we decide you know, crucial questions in the process of uh, social transformation. Surely there are technologies that would be used um, in a post-capitalist society, capitalist technology, current technologies that would be used in a, in a post-capitalist society. This doesn't mean necessarily that we consume uh, at the current level, but again, levels of consumption and what is necessary and not necessary has to be decided on a, a democratic basis. And third, the question of growth is not the central question, I think. If capitalism without growth cannot exist, I mean, capitalists need growth, that is the whole basis of the system, and convincing the capitalist classes to degrow is an impossibility, then degrowth is tending towards utopianism. And it's the wrong question because we do need growth in large parts of the world. And I think proponents of degrowth concede that some things need to grow and some things uh, need to degrow. But then may, perhaps that's the case for abandoning the name. The real problem is the chaos of the unplanned accumulation of capital. And everything in society tells us not to address that question. So as socialists, I think we, we, we would say that we need to call it what it is and be ruthlessly focused on it. Otherwise, I think even left, even the left-wing versions of uh, degrowth uh, are in danger of being anti-working class, because who is going to do the degrowing? Not the capitalist class. It will be uh, the vast majority. If you talk about particularly levels of consumption. Um, so I think. Of course, we do have to improve people's lives and rapidly decarbonize at the same time. And I don't think that those are incompatible. I think we can do uh, those two things at the same time, not just can, we have to do those things at the same time and they have to go um, hand in hand. And of course, I think, you know, abandoning, for example, GDP as the sole measure, measure of progress would be a good thing. Uh, I think, uh, we can and will have a new vision of, of, of what abundance means. But the issue is one of scale combined with conscious planning. We know that uh, the potential for, for, for renewables and sustainable energy systems is, is, is vast, given that at the moment there isn't the urgency and the mechanism to, to make them happen. Um, but high income countries will only be able to scale down if at some level this is initiated and managed by the state, it's at an individual level, it's, it's not possible to get the kind of scale and speed that we need. So uh, just to end it here, we need to exert as much pressure as possible on the current state um, 
and, and raise the question at the same time of more democratic ways of running society, which is um, uh, why it comes down to, to a question of power. But through that, building on the existing struggles, it, I think is the best place to start. Okay, finish, finish. Yeah. Thanks, Faisy. Okay, okay. Uh, the next speaker is Kai Heron. Great, thanks. Um, hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm really, I'm glad to be going after Faisy because there's going to be a couple, a couple of disagreements that I, I hope will be generative and useful. So thank you everyone for coming. Thank you again for the organizers for the invitation to speak. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure to be here and also to see some familiar names and faces in the audience. So uh, I hope we have a good conversation. Uh, right, so my initial talk today was going to be called In Defense of Eco-Communism, and I was going to try and kind of chart a third way between eco-modernism and degrowth. Um, but when I started to think about the event a little bit more, I decided to change track. And what I want to do today instead is kind of that, but more to muddy the waters uh, in the ongoing debate between so-called eco-modernism and degrowth. And to put it plainly, I think this debate has reached something of an impasse and that while the emerging synthesis of degrowth with Marxism holds some potential, it's increasingly evident that eco-modernism is a kind of simplified and ecologically illiterate interpretation of Marxism, class struggle and the compounding socio-ecological crises that we face. I make that argument in four in a longer paper that I wrote while I was trying to get my thoughts together uh, for this talk. But in the time that I have now, I'm going to focus on just a few of these points and hope that we can pick up on the broader discussion in the Q&A. So let me begin. So for some years now, eco-socialist and left environmental debate has been locked into orbit around two sharply contrasting perspectives, degrowth and left eco-modernism. The former is a really quite diverse school of thought, often associated with Jason Hickel, Kohei Sato, Stefania Barker, Georgos Kallis, and others. Left eco-modernism, meanwhile, and we have to stipulate left here because there is a reactionary eco-modernism too, it's just called capitalism and capitalists, is usually represented in these debates by Matt Huber, Lee Phillips, Jacobin's editorial line on environmental issues, and proponents of these kind of growth-based Green New Deal, such as Robert Pollan. So for the time being, I'm going to assume that most of us here are familiar with what these perspectives are, and suffice to say that they are fundamentally different, right? There are real, substantive, and irreconcilable differences between these two schools of thought. Their visions based on opposed analyses of the political subject that will secure an eco-socialist transition, how they will secure it, and upon what technological basis. But for all that, I increasingly find the debate quite unedifying and even frustrating. And part of the problem is that left eco-modernism has frequently misinterpreted degrowth as a homogenous political perspective and has subsequently missed some of degrowth's intricacies and some of its weaknesses. Degrowth's proponents are united by the idea that growth, growth or growthism or growth-based paradigms are a barrier to human and non-human flourishing. But beyond that, there's a huge disagreement about how to bring about a more sustainable social system and even what that system would look like. So proposals range from a kind of degrowth anarchism to eco-socialist degrowth to degrowth policy wonks. You know, we just need to introduce the right policies and we'll get it. And even kind of degrowth business models. There's plenty of those around at the moment, too. So to treat these very different political horizons as one, I think is to miss something important about the breadth of degrowth's influence and appeal across the political spectrum but also its lack of an innate political vision. Simply put, degrowth is not a politics. It's an umbrella term for a series of socio-ecological propositions that have been fused onto a diversity of political perspectives, resulting in very different ideas about what degrowth means. So one of the most promising fusions, I think, is this combination that we're here to talk about of degrowth with eco-socialism, explored in the work of Michael Lowry, Kohei Sato, Gareth Bale, Stefania Barker, and John Bellamy Foster, among others. Whereas many non-Marxist proponents of degrowth limit their critique of capitalism to a critique of growth, which is a blunt weapon that conflates growth's numerous denotations, GDP, material throughput, energetic throughput, and so on, Marxist degrowth promises to draw on a far sharper critical set of instruments developed through historical materialism. So exploitation, surplus value, 
commodity fetishism, dependency, and social reproduction. And while many non-Marxist proponents of degrowth have overlooked the importance of class struggle as a site and the site of production to socio-ecological transformation, Marxist degrowth has emphasized the need for class struggle and transformations in what is produced, how, and by whom. The demand is for a qualitative transformation in how we live our lives, the contours of which would be broadly familiar to any communist. On top of this, work by Jason Hickel, Mariano Felis, and others has drawn degrowth into proximity with anti-imperialist and third world Marxist thought, potentially opening movements in the core to repertoires of struggle, avenues of action, and acts of solidarity with struggles in that word, the global South, right? I'm, I'm gonna draw on this geography. While disagreements inevitably persist among Marxist degrowthers on important issues, not least of which is political strategy, and while proponents tend to overstate the novelty of degrowth's contributions to international socialist thought, overlooking that much of what goes under the name of degrowth was previously articulated by ecologically minded Marxists and so-called third world Marxists like Sankara, Mario Tegui, Amakar Cabral, and so forth. The fusion of degrowth and Marxism, I think, is one of the most promising intellectual developments in the imperial cause green left. Yet according to eco-modernism, any engagement with degrowth marks a radical departure from Marxism and working class interests. So as Matt puts it in Climate Change as Class War, insofar as degrowth has gained popularity, it is only among, quote, the professional managerial class whose, quote, contempt for the working and consuming masses and whose psychological turmoil about their, quote, complicity in consumer society finds its clearest expression in degrowth. For left eco-modernists then, what's needed is a return to the good old fashioned politics of classical Marxism. I think that argument would be persuasive if left eco-modernism were offering an anti-imperialist and ecologically literate Marxist politics. But unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. In their recent review of Kohei Sato's Marx in the Anthropocene and Slow Down, which I'll be referring to for the rest of this talk, Huber and Phillips present their clearest summation of left eco-modernist politics so far. And in the process, they demonstrate a series of misconceptions that in a longer, longer article, I try to clarify. I clarify them not from the position of a proponent of degrowth Marxism, but from the position of an anti-imperialist eco-Marxist. My sense is that this perspective, a Marxism that isn't eco-modernist, a Marxism that doesn't channel itself through degrowth, but rather through the internationalist Marxist tradition, is underrepresented in these debates so far. And it's something I sort of tried to introduce in that short piece for Sycar, um, a couple of, maybe last year now. So in the full paper, I cover four areas of disagreement, value transfers, the FETA thesis, socio-ecological limits and definitions of class struggle, but we only have 10 to 13 minutes each. So I'm gonna focus on the first of these, which is value transfers and what their denial implies for eco-modernist thought. And I'm, I'm glad I did that and made that choice because I think it follows nicely from Faisi's remarks and generates some useful discussions. So the denial of the existence or importance of value transfers and uneven ecological exchange from the periphery to the core is one of left eco-modernism's defining features. In their recent review, Huber and Phillips cite Charles Post's 2011 article, A Critique of the Theory of the Labour Aristocracy, to claim that the idea of value transfers has been, quote, long discredited. Yet Post's article is by no means a decisive critique of value transfers or uneven ecological exchange, and its conclusions are at the very least questionable. Zach Cope, for instance, refuted Post's empirical and conceptual evidence more than a decade ago, while numerous works have since been published showing the past and present significance of value transfers and uneven ecological exchange, even as the material standard of living in the imperial core is beginning to decline. And I do think that's important and a space of opportunity for solidarity and something we should talk about more. Much of this important work comes from the third world and from anti-imperialist Marxist traditions that neither Huber and Phillips nor Post engage with at all. While by no means homogenous on this or any other issue, scholars including Amir Bagchi, Utsur and Prabhat Patnik, Ali Kadri, Anwar Abdel Malik, Walter Rodney, Sam Harman, Marie Marini, Claudio Katz, and Intan Suandi have all demonstrated the importance of value transfers and uneven ecological exchange, both historically and in the present day. So I would suggest that value transfers and uneven ecological exchange have to be denied by left eco-modernism, because to accept that workers in the core might benefit from the proceeds of capitalism's global division of labor, whether through wages, consumer goods, raw material transfers, access to infrastructure, 
healthcare, and so on, is to complicate the story about working class interests in the core and working class entanglement within imperialist and neo-colonial relations of accumulation. The global division of labor means that though they are exploited themselves through their differentiated integration into capital circuits of accumulation, workers in the imperial core may also participate in the realization of value generated through the exploitation, domination, and even death of workers elsewhere in the core, but also in the periphery. The working class, in other words, is internally differentiated along gendered, racial, and national lines, and the immediate interests of various sectors of the global working class can and do come into opposition with one another. Grasping this is an important condition for international solidarity. Ten, ten minutes. You've had ten minutes, Karen. I know. I'll be, I'll be there. I'll be there. Don't worry. <laughs> Okay, so grassmiths is important for international solidarity. When workers in the imperial core consume foodstuffs produced through widespread drought, inducing deforestation in the periphery, for example, or when they're employed to build weapons used to genocide Palestinians, solidarity requires a degree of sacrifice on the part of workers in the imperial core. As Lenin once put it, internationalism on the part of the oppressors or great nations must consist not only in the observance of the formal equality of nations, but even an inequality of the oppressor nation that must make up for the inequality which obtains in actual practice. Anybody who does not understand this has not grasped the real proletarian attitude of the national question. So through its denial of value transfers and under theorization of how imperialism is reproduced through the everyday lives of some workers in the core, eco-modernism refuses this difficult political terrain. Huber and Phillips suggested it is, quote, slander that workers in the developed world are imperialists whose everyday lives are a primary driver of ecological breakdown. But this is putting words into the mouths of anti-imperialist Marxists and degrowth Marxists alike. No anti-imperialist Marxist or proponent of a synthesis between Marxism and degrowth that I am aware of has claimed that workers in the imperial core are a primary driver of our compounding ecological crises. But to say that the working class in the imperial core can contribute through their work or consumption should be beyond dispute. I think to deny this is to blind oneself to the reality of historical capitalism, while to recognize it is to put oneself on the side of the global working class, the vast majority of which does not live in the imperial core. So two more points. This ironically brings proponents of degrowth, which frequently emphasize the effects of a global division of labor and the resulting separation of production from consumption or the production and realization of value far closer to the interests of the global working class than left eco-modernism. The existence or otherwise of value transfers then is not long discredited as it was put. It's a live issue and one I would suggest that degrowth Marxism is on the right side of. So to conclude, critics of degrowth and degrowth Marxism often claim that this objective analysis of what Samir Armin called accumulation on a world scale is a moralizing and individualizing critique that functions only to make workers in the imperial core feel guilty for the petty pleasures afforded to them by capital. This is simply not the case. The point is to acknowledge that the challenges faced, the point rather is to acknowledge the challenges faced by an eco-socialist project today. The point is to better understand the terrain of struggle so that workers across the world can think more strategically about what is to be done. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kai. So now it's, um, it's, it's Professor uh, uh, Kim T to, to speak. Over to you. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me to this seminar. It's my first time to join you. And um, I hope that we can start some uh, good discussions. Well, when we when I was given this topic of uh, growth, degrowth, then we have to ask, what kind of growth are we criticizing? So, of course, uh, we talk about capitalism and imperialism. But then in that case, then uh, we have to see what kind of growth we uh, would want to critique and we would want to do away with. So I think uh, I, I will just uh, in this first round um, give uh, some kind of um, data and I hope that uh, you maybe it, uh, it wouldn't be too common sense kind of things that, uh, to, to discuss. Uh, I think for the, for the capitalist uh, modernization, uh, the one of uh, the one key thing is uh, about energy, 
And today we are having and uh, we are seeing that the question of energy is the most unsustainable thing. Uh, with and capitalism is also in deep crisis on the question of energy. So we don't need to preach to the converted because we all know about what uh, climate change is doing. We are to, uh, saying that we shouldn't say climate change. We should be talking about climate collapse. And we have this global heating that's going on. Just uh, uh, two days ago in Hong Kong, we broke the record of 150 years of having over 32 degrees Celsius in March. So... Uh, I think we need not um, uh, go into all the details about how we are now faced with all the fossil fuel um, problems. And uh, but then what I would like to discuss is when we talk about this, are we going have uh, do we have to choose uh, between uh, one of the two evils? Is there something called lesser evil if we talk about, uh, if we make a comparison between a fossil fuel uh, energy and so-called clean energy. So uh, I, I, I will just skip the part about fossil fuel because I think that is something that I think um, it has been made very evident. Uh, but then about the question of clean energy. So uh, I think it is really obscene to talk, uh, to be um, working on uh, so-called biofuel, which is not bio at all. It's, we should just call it agrofuel because it's um, feeding uh, machines and aeroplanes instead of feeding people uh, with the crops. But then uh, the other um, energy that has been so much discussed is about so-called clean energy. That is about the nuclear energy. So recently, um, we, have, we published, uh, I and some friends, we published You've muted yourself. Ah, sorry. Uh, okay. So many people um, now uh, 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 remember the catastrophe of Fukushima because of the discharge of the nuclear contaminated water. If not for this discharge, would you have thought that things have been, things are going fine? There's already the Olympics. The Japanese government assured everybody that it's safe to have all the drinking water. And the Olympics was conducted precisely to show the world that Japan has recovered from the catastrophe. But then if we look at the water discharge problem, so far um, we have uh, 1.3 million tons of contaminated water still in the tanks. And every day, 100 more tons are being produced. And the, 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 water, the contaminated water have been discharged into the sea for seven months now, which uh, amounts to 31,000 31, tons of the uh, nuclear contaminated water. So why is it that we are having all this contaminated water? Because nothing has been done uh, about the uh, three uh, reactors that had exploded. The debris, they are, uh, with, uh, are still exposed and you need the cool water to go to cool it down every day, to run over it every day so that it doesn't uh, continue to, it wouldn't explode. And now how much uh, of those debris do we have? We have 880 tons of these ra radioactive debris waiting to be removed and nothing has been done. Nothing at all. The um, the robots that have been sent in managed uh, two years ago managed to pick up uh, one debris of the size of a, a soya bean, and that was the achievement. So the catastrophe of Fukushima should be uh, reckoned, and so. But then now, because of the the problems with the uh, fuel with the oil, then people uh, everywhere. We are returning, we are saying that we return, we go back to nuclear energy. So uh, in uh, Japan, before uh, the catastrophe started, uh, it relied on 30, uh, it, uh, the nuclear energy provided 30% of the um, energy. And now only nine of the 42 operable uh, nuclear reactors are working in Japan. 
So when the catastrophe happened, then in Europe and in many places, then people were saying that we should do a, we should get rid of nuclear energy. And China was also uh, going through a whole screening of the safety of the, of, of the nuclear things. But now, because China pledged to have carbon emission peak by 2030 and to have carbon neut neutrality by 2060, is going much further on nuclear energy. And today, 55 nuclear reactors are running in China, but that provides only for 3% of the energy in China. So uh, China is now building uh, 150 more. That means uh, two times more. Uh, so that by 2035, it will have 10% of energy coming from nuclear. And to be to arrive at on the in the date of 2060 when China plans to turn a carbon neutral, is it, it will have a nuclear energy compo comprising uh, 18 percent of its energy use. That would mean that you will need over 300 nuclear reactors. So somebody has said that if we are to have to replace all the fossil fuel energy in the world today. The, the world will have to build 10,000 nuclear reactors. So, uh, so, but then I think, uh, for example, these questions about energy should be uh, in within our horizon. So are we to choose between the lesser evil? Is there a lesser evil between fossil fuel uh, and fossil fuel, which uh, uh, well, uh, brings us all this climate collapse or with the, the clean and safe nuclear energy that we and but now we are also seeing that it's not just a question of accidents, it's also the question of deliberate use as a weapon. And so we have uh, in Europe there was all this concern about the Saporizhia uh, uh, nuclear power plant, and we are all talking about a possible nuclear uh, war. So we are really in a mad stage when we are mutually assuring everybody of destruction. So I think uh, if we look at um, growth, then we look at uh, capitalist modernization and there's such a heavy use of energy. But then it doesn't mean that it's being very progressive. We are seeing that um, the kind of energy that is being used uh, is actually regressing. If we look at the uh, the, the term, uh, the energy return on energy investment, the EROEI. That means uh, how much uh, there's, uh, how much return, energy return there is by uh, an input of one. So uh, by the input of one uh, energy uh, investment. So um, in the pre, uh, in, well, I think 200 years ago, we were burning wood that gave us four uh, in return. So it's four to one. For coal, it was 10 to one. Petroleum, for some time, it became 100 to one. And then later on, when we don't get all this easy fuel, it was 50 to one, and then it's, it's coming down. So just guess what is the nuclear return? The nuclear return is four to one. That is exactly the same like the wood burning that we had uh, 200 years ago. So if we look at all these, we can understand why the energy issue is a, is, a, is a dilemma for capitalism, that it cannot continue to grow. So people are now talking about nuclear fusion, that we can make the, the, sun, the, the suns that can burn and can give us infinite energy. And so that is supposed to give us 30,000 uh, to one for the return. But then at the kind of um, so-called slow progress on this, then we have to look into how, why and also how dangerous it is. is. So I think I still have yeah. two minutes more, so I'll just uh, yeah. be very yeah. quick. I think um, the that is I, I, what I want to say is that the energy question should be our central concern. And then if we look at uh, the, the kind of food we are having, so uh, before, before uh, the uh, 1950, one calorie of fossil fuel energy uh, would generate 2.3 uh, calorie of food energy. But today is the other way around. Today is 10 calories of fossil fuel energy that would generate one calorie of food energy. So you ask why? But look at all the fertilizers, look at all the transport, all this so-called world division of labor, etc. So today we are 23 times more using energy 
to produce our food. So I think uh, uh, now we are also talking about more progress when we have all these uh, AI. Uh, uh, now everybody is celebrating AI. Of course, we look at all the unemployment issues. But if we look at the energy issue for AI, the AI centers, uh, they are, the AI servers, they will be using, somebody calculated, they use up about 0.5% of the global electricity consumption. And the um, uh, the data centers in uh, the U United States use up 4% of electricity. So now we are having the chat GPT. They use half a million kilowatt hours of electricity every day. So we are calling this growth and progress. So I feel that, uh, well, we can come back to all this later in the discussions. Uh, what I want to say is that if we look at um, uh, the, if we talk about degrowth, we should be we should specify what we are looking at and how we can be changing this pattern, this paradigm of production and consumption, this this mode of uh, 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 yeah, energy energy usage. But thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have the last of the speakers in this first uh, first round. Uh, the last from the speakers in the first round, Matt, Matt Hoover. Over to you. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Diego, for inviting me and organizing this. Um, I prepared a talk. I got to try to withhold the, the temptation to respond to a lot of what's been said so far. I also am the only nerd who prepared a PowerPoint because I think Zoom can be somewhat soul crushing. So I think some images kind of help us. Um, follow along. I didn't really ask it to do that. That's wild. Okay. So um, first of all, I want to kind of want to echo everything Faisy said, but I especially want to echo um, her statement about the genocide happening in Palestine. I'm the only speaker coming from the heart of empire in this horrific government with their intransigent insistence to continue funding Israel's war crimes. And um, I think Faisy's exactly right. We need to sort of think about how to channel these um, mobilizations in a larger anti-capitalist struggle. So now to my talk, the Marxists, I think, need to acknowledge a complicated relationship with growth. On the one hand, it could be said that the Marxist project itself came out of a historically unprecedented period of economic growth following the Industrial Revolution. In the age of revolution, uh, Eric Hobsbawm described the industrial growth as by any reckoning, this is probably the most important event in world history. He goes on to say, for the first time in human history, the shackles were taken off the productive power of human societies. And this uh, is now te technically known to the economist as the takeoff into self-sustained growth. Later saying that the economy uh, became, as it were, airborne. And this is a problematic measure, but this is kind of what airborne looks like and essentially the ways in which the Industrial Revolution unlocked massive increases in, in labor productivity. And for Marx and Engels, it was this growth, this massive increase in productive capacity that really laid the foundations for the abolition of class and the liberation of humanity as a whole. Engels said it clearly in Socialism, U Utopian and Scientific, arguing that really class rule had this historical basis in what he called the ins insufficiency of production and the modern productive forces created the possibility um, for the first time that basically, uh, you know, we could make it so everyone could be taken care of and fully sufficient materially, but also guaranteeing to all the free development and exercise of their physical and mental faculties. And he said the possibility is now for the first time here, but it is here. And I think this industrial growth sort of created these material conditions that Marx and Engels saw as, as an opening for the abolition of class society. Now, this massive growth uh, also entailed the growth of capital and with it, as Marx said, the multiplication of the proletariat. And with this growing proletariat came the rise of working class movements, labor and socialist parties, union organizations, the Marxist variants of which all pointed toward capitalist growth and abundance as the precondition to a truly world historical transformation, again, where all humanity could be liberated from class rule, toil, and scarcity. 
Now these movements won power in various uh, ways. And as Hobsbawm put it in one point in the 20th century, one third of humanity lived in countries that could claim to be part of this sort of project of ushering, uh, ushering in a world historical revolution under the name of communism. But after the horrors of World War II, a new vision of growth came to subsume all others. While the socialist story of growth was focused more on use values and material abundance, this version fixated on exchange value and the statistical measures of monetary transactions we now call gross domestic product, GDP, like the value form itself, really abstracted from what we could uh, uh, call socially useful growth, like building child care centers or, uh, and socially destructive growth. Um, and I think many speakers have pointed to this, like building weapons factories, for instance. And the only thing that mattered, if the money line goes up, the economy was seen as healthy. So what Math Matthias Schmel uh, uh, Schmeller calls the hegemony of growth, uh, basically they argued that a whole host of social benefits, whether it be poverty alleviation, public investment, and even environmental policy was only, only possible in societies that committed themselves to GDP growth. And by the 1970s, the irrationality of a society blindly devoted to this GDP growth was apparent. Uh, and this is actually the same moment when these working class and socialist movements and their different vision of growth were defeated, right? And in their place, I think we've had a kind of new anti-growth politics that emerged from you know, scientists positing natural resource limits to growth, ecological economists arguing about thermodynamic entropy laws, requiring a massive drawdown of, of energy use, and environmental activists who started to see industrial development itself as inherently destructive. And of course, one can debate the scientific merits of these assessments, but it's hard to escape the striking parallels between this discourse and at the same moment in the 1970s, this kind of neoliberal turn toward austerity. The generosity of the welfare state and union power had overshot its reasonable share of the social surplus, shackling the real source of competitive energy, that is capital. And it was time to scale back to tighten our belts, or as Paul Volcker put it, the standard of living of the average American must decline. So if, the capital, if capitalism developed a hegemony of growth or what some call growthism, the anti-growth politics simply negated that. And I would contend this anti-growth politics has kind of overtaken the left since the 1970s, um, culminating in the current popularity of degrowth, so much so that we now have a whole issue of the monthly review devoted to it. And um, even some like Kohei Saito claiming that Marx himself became a degrowth communist late in his life. But I'm uh, continuing to try to argue that this degrowth politics really does sit in real tension with what should be some basic principles of Marxism that really did emerge from that period of growth in the 19th century. First, okay, it's doing this weird thing. Uh, if Marxism at its core is the principle that the emancipation of the working classes must be conquered by the working classes themselves, I argue degrowth is is really, and Fezzi uh, uh, has said this, and I think Kai said this, you know, I consider it a pretty insular politics, mostly amongst academics and the professional class that I don't think is really going to resonate with the masses of ordinary workers facing the kind of material deprivation and economic insecurity. Um, I don't think you're going to get masses of people fighting for degrowth. Um, uh, now, for its middle class adherents, surrounded by relative comfort and the affluence of middle class life in the global north, degrowth politics fixates on the kind of excesses of consumption all around them, right? And the modes of living that in, that embed these benefits of, of consumerism and all the rest. But I, I agree with Fezzi, as, as this sort of does downplay the central role of capital and production in actually organizing ecological crisis. And while degrowth does appropriate many pro-worker policies from socialism and social democracy, such as reduction of work hours and, and so forth, the general orientation and programmatic definition center around what I call politics of less, a politics of reduction, a politics of downscaling, and so forth. The second point I want to make is that degrowth is again trapped in the ideological presuppositions of capitalist 
deep, sorry, of capitalist growth discourse in the first place. And, and oh, I want to go here, actually. <laughs> it, it's, essentially, degrowth just negates capitalist hege hegemonic ideological focus on, on growth, right? But the Marxist project was always about seizing the industrial means of production and harnessing the gains of, of labor productivity and repurposing production toward social needs. Um, now, there is no more significant social need now than confronting the ecological crisis, but I would argue confronting that crisis is not really a quantitative question of more or less or growth or degrowth. It's, a, it's about what Kai said, a, a qualitative transformation. It's about different. It's a, we need a different production system, a different way of life, and all the rest. So addressing ecological problems calls for contextual, qualitative transformations of specific sectors of production, rather than some abstract or generalized commitment to degrowth. Put simply, degrowthers consistently misdiagnose the core problem of capitalism as growth, when in fact, the real problem is our lack of social control over production and over investment decisions. It's about our lack of power over the socio-ecological metabolism. If we attain such power, we may indeed choose to grow many socially useful forms of production and degrow others. When you talk to degrowth proponents, they actually agree with this idea. They do want to grow lots of socially useful sectors of the economy, like education, childcare, housing, public transit. You've had 10 minutes, Beth. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, uh, the project is about gr some growth and some degrowth. But at this stage, the name, if we're, if we're going to grow and degrow, the name and overall orientation of degrowth loses its coherence. And we have to say it's actually not about degrowth. So what I'd like to suggest is what we don't, we don't want degrowth. We want socialist planning. Um, and, and we want to make collective democratic decisions over our production system. Now, some degrowthers will pivot to insist that we do need some sort of aggregate reductions in material throughput or energy use that's required for ecological sustainability. But I would contend that a socialist commitment to planning and production for social needs should not be interested in such abstract and quantitative aggregate measures. It should be concerned with qualitative use values, democratically defining human social needs, and measuring concrete ecological impacts on various production options. Indeed, the degrowth critique of GDP was always about the kind of violence of such abstract aggregate measures and their inability to grasp the con concrete specificities of natural ecological systems. Now, the final point, if I can make it very quickly, is Marxism used to argue that the main limits we face were internal to capitalism. It's capitalism. Oops, there it is. Capitalism that limits us, and it limits production to only what gives growth to capital, profits to capital. Socialism was meant to be about unshackling humanity from these limits to allow us utter flexibility in democratically determining what our collective needs actually are. This is about harnessing true human freedom over what we produce and why. And I do fear degrowth is about asserting a new set of shackles from the very outset of the conversation. Now, to be clear, the democratic determination of such needs must confront and acknowledge ecological limits that are outside of the capital relation, but compared to the limits of capital, these pale in comparison. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Matt, and thanks to all the four speakers for uh, such interesting presentations, all within their time, which gives us plenty of time for discussion. So can people can people raise their hands, preferably raising your hands using the, the function, um, the, the, the function provided by Zoom, but if not, um, we can, uh, you can, you can just say, you can send a message. Okay, right. I see we have three people who've raised their hands. Um, Let's start with Harvey. Harvey first, followed by Megan. Hello, thank you very much. It's been interesting to listen to you all. I'd first of all like to um, corroborate, I don't know if that's the right word, but essentially uh, the focus on Palestine has been good. I'd also say 
and this is I won't take I don't think it's necessarily the place to argue it now, but in the future, if you're going to talk about being within, you know, um, put Palestine at the core of it to not write with ardent Zionists or produce work with them in the future. Um, the second point is I think something's been greatly missed from this um, debate is necessarily defining what growth is because it seems like everyone has had a slightly different idea. I don't know if I can generally, I don't know if I can shoot this to, I don't know, the, the four speakers, but necessarily like what do you see is the difference between um, gro growth in the capitalist sense versus growth um, in... I guess a socialist sense, because I think Huber touched on a good point of like degrowth isn't necessarily a de degrowth in everything and for everything. So I think a lot of the a lot of things get lost in I guess we're not actually defining the parameters of debate because in my in my imagination or in my opinion, de um, growth to me is very much a capitalist a capitalistic phrase a capitalist. Um, sort of idea an ideal and degrowth is you know a, you know again like sort of challenging that hegemony but you also bring up you know but socialism can grow in other ways but what is that growth is this a grow and how do you grow is this a growth of you know means of production because i'm sure no one's going to be talking about getting you know lowering you know how you know housing and healthcare. But what what to you is a what what, what to you is a socialist degrow uh, so what what to you is a socialist growth and how does that differ and how then does it also not become just another form of I guess accumulation um, or capital accumulation um, no thank you thank you very much uh, so Megan next followed by Simon. Thank you. That, that, that yeah, was really. There's also a, ch a question in the chat from Candy. Sorry. Sorry. So, should I continue? Yes. Yes, please continue. Okay. Well, that was that was great. What a wonderful um, discussion. Two points I want to make. First of all, about nuclear power, uh, the Kim Chi Lao was referring to. Uh, Nuclear power and nuclear generation of electricity would not exist without nuclear weapons. It, it was developed to produce the fuel for Trident and the, and the nuclear um, uh, weapons program. And even Japan sends some of its uh, material to the UK for processing into material that's used in the Trident program. So we, we need to be clear that nuclear has never and never will be an economic source or a, uh, a, um, a, a source of fuel that doesn't produce um, carbon dioxide. For example, three quarters of all the energy production in Southwest Australia is being used to produce uranium. My second point is about the impossibility that the market can deal with climate change through renewables. So if, if you were thinking rationally about renewables, you would be putting solar panels on very many homes. You would be producing bioreactors for processing the sewage from homes. You would be generating hydropower from the sewage. Homes could become a source of energy. And in that case, the energy companies should be paying lo uh, local for the energy that's being produced in uh, locally. And the, th the other point about this is that the energy transmission costs are around about 30% of all the energy that's being produced. If you produce that energy locally, i.e. in a housing estate or whatever, then actually you're far more efficient. So my point is that capitalist 
system actually prevents the uh, effective use of renewables for ameliorating climate change. And Thank you. Um, Simon, and then um, let's see if Candy wants to read her question. Simon? Thanks, Alex. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it was a really excellent discussion. And um, uh, this is, I've, I've, I've been to a few <laughs> things like this recently. And I think this has been one of the best ones. So thank you to the to the speakers for the for the clarity of their of their points. Um, just just a couple of things that I wanted to raise stemming from the discussion. I mean, on uh, Faisi's criticism of the concept of the imperial mode of living, I mean, I think if that's taken to mean that everyone in the quote unquote global north is completely incorporated into capitalism and is, you know, kind of useless for, you know, like kind of any global socialist struggle or anything like that, then then obviously I don't think that that's, that that's right or a helpful way of seeing things. But we do have to think about how the arguments around the environment do impact in different countries in different ways. I mean, <clears throat> In Britain, in countries like Britain, you know, there is a huge issue that, which is something that the far right is connecting with, that they see any moves towards kind of eco-socialism or, or, you know, degrowth or like anything like that as an attack on people's living standards. I mean, the whole thing around the 15-minute cities and and um, the, uh, uh, you know, the the communists are coming to take away your cars and stop you from traveling abroad on holiday. You know, like it's all kind of pitched as um, an attack on living standards, an attack on sort of the quote unquote freedoms that we enjoy. So thinking about how scarcity or the fear of scarcity works its way out um, uh, in terms of people's like responses, I think is very important. Of course, in countries like you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo, where only 13% of people have got access to electricity, it's a completely different discussion around um, around the mode of living and the changes that need to be made. So um, I do think that some of the degrowth arguments which do point to the to the very radical and serious difference between workers in the, you know, quote unquote, global south and the kind of imperialist nations is is something that we have to think about and we have to think about what that means um just the other point i want to say very quickly is <clears throat> um i mean i i wouldn't call myself a degrowther although i do think a lot of the points that degrowth writers like kai and you know jason hickel and so on make are very important and um often very useful things to think about um, I do think there is still possibility of more convergence, though, between, Matt, say, Matt's and maybe Faisi's position and um, uh, Kai's position as it was articulated here. Um, what about the idea of radical abundance? Well, I don't like I know people are talking about this, but it wasn't mentioned. Um, not n not trying to be cowardly and sidestepping the deep growth debate. But if we think about things positively, about abundance, about, you know, kind of radically um a fight for greater access to universal services um radical abundance doesn't mean just more consumer junk that we buy all the time but it means a qualitatively improved way of life free from market economics and the kind of grind of capital accumulation um i think there's a lot of overlap there between even how matt sees it and how some of the de like the degrowthers see it so yeah i'd be interested to know more about um from the panelists about what they think about that Hi. Um, is it my turn? Uh, hi. I think, I don't know if uh, Alex just lost um, connection. I think we were waiting for Candy. Candy, do you want to read your uh, your question or um, shall we? Yeah, I, I think probably this is the last uh, question of this round. I think there is quite a lot on the, on the plate. So probably you are the last question. And then uh, Lawrence, you will be the first of the next round. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Please, Candy. Thank you. Um, so I do have a question about the the green transformation or, or us going to a green economy. 
um, in my own work, I'm studying around the copper and the mega mining pits, especially in Chile and other parts of Latin America. And um, I'm just wondering, where does this argument fit in with the degrowth models that you guys are talking about in terms of, you know, we have the increased, the, the three things that are really driving it is our solar panels, electric cars, and windmills, and all three of those use excessive amounts of copper. And then I'll also, like, I have a talk that I'm doing tomorrow, but I'll also be talking about how that push for copper is also at the same time part, you know, the excuse is the post-COVID economic recovery, right? Um, so we do get permission to do this because we want to go green. Let's extract more from the global south. We want to go green. Um, oh, oh, it's because companies, didn't, they need to recover from the economic backslide that they had during COVID. So there are ample like capitalist excuses for doing these things. But where does stopping that, um, that particular transaction, right, and, and, and around extractive imperialism, where does stopping it come out of the degrowth uh, debates that I'm hearing you guys talk about? Thank you. Um, thank you, Candy. So shall we follow the same order uh, or do you prefer inverse order? Uh, Faisy, do you want to go first? Sure, yes, whichever. Um, yeah, okay, so where do I start? Um, uh, the first um, speaker talked, the first uh, person who asked the question talked about um, to define what degrowth is and what, what you know, what what is the sort of difference between the, the capitalist sense and the, and the socialist sense? I mean, obviously we know what the, we live under what the capitalist sense of, uh, of growth is. And, you know, I think, I think everyone here has a, has a critique of it. And this is the heart of the, the, the question. I think, you know, the, the, the socialist growth would, growth would, I think, mean using the technologies uh, that we have and developing more technologies to make the lives of everyone easier. So you, you, you know, you would have, I mean, I'm saying obvious things here, you would have democratic control over um, uh, uh, the development of that technology, the ownership of that technology, uh, and so on. So, so AI, you would you would democratically decide and obviously you would find ways. I mean, it's such a massive, you know, global all encompassing thing as, as is climate change, but you would find um, mechanisms for, for ensuring that there is control over, over technology. And crucially it has to, it has to, um, you know, be instrumental, right? We, we use it um, uh, on, on an equal basis. Um, on the on the and and I guess yeah in a nutshell I think that's what that's what uh, that's what a, a, a socialist conception of of, of growth would um, would mean I'm sure there's a lot more to say on that um, the the question of um, nuclear power I, I, I'm sure you know there's there's lots of debate about that um, um, here um, so I won't I won't necessarily go 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 on about this but I do think in a way. There's a sort of parallel here with with geoengineering. I in a world of of nuclear weapons and nuclear war, I don't trust any capitalist government uh, with developing um, nuclear power in a way that, or developing the 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 you know the 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 fuel in a way that can be used safely. Um, so, I mean, just like I don't trust, you know, the American government or indeed any British government or any government to um, to to, yeah, to um, to undertake geoengineering because because they they want to keep things as they are. And, and that's, um, you know, that that's the whole point of it. Um, so. Uh, and then the question about, you know, the, the criticism of the imperial mode of living. I mean, it's hard to, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, it, it, Saito for me w w is is well, it's quite clear. It's hard to see that he's is he's saying anything different than than that, uh, unless he you know he comes back on that. But I think, um, and I've just got the um, uh, slow down. I haven't I haven't cracked it open yet. But uh, you know, I think he's he's um, 
he he's not uh, saying anything different um on that question i think in in his new work so he's not coming back and saying oh well actually this is what i meant so um i think um you know the 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 question of um uh, it being an attack you know simon's question an attack on 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 people's living standards that that the, that this is what degrowth or eco eco socialism will be I think in a way, firstly, Rishi Sunak has done that for us because he's 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 telling working people we're not going to rip out your rip out your um you know your 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 boilers to install heat pumps and we're not going to do anything basically. You know, we you can have diesel, you can have all of these things. Um, but uh yeah, I mean I think that it, it, partly it's one of um it's one of being initiated on a on a on a scale that can facilitate some sort of transition to happen and of course this is why for me one we always have to come back to okay everyone everyone here can agree that capitalism you know is is the problem so then the question is how do we start making a dent in that question how do we start and that is a strategic question you know we won't get a government that is going to do the things that we want them to do unless there is the kind of pressure unless there is um a start to rearranging global geopolitics and and we have to do it that way and again again in terms of you know disagreements and thing i don't think people disagree that that DRC has to grow. I mean, 13% having access to electricity, of course. Um, I mean, you know, and then just a final point on on um, on radical abundance. I mean, Kate Soper came out with a book, I think a couple of years ago on uh, post-growth living. And, you know, the ideas are very good. You know, I don't think, you know, we want uh, a, more of a focus on use values, of course, than, than exchange values. That's not, that isn't the question, um, but, so, you know, we can all think of great things, you know, community sharing tools and all of this sort of thing. Wonderful. It's just that, of course, but but it, it, if Kai is saying class struggle is, um, you know, a part of the degrowth, uh, you know, agenda and part of its strategy and so on, I would like to see more of this. I mean, the vast majority of degrowth literature doesn't even come close to mentioning this so i suppose you know maybe that is an area that that needs exploring um but you know the fight for universal you know services and 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 growing education and health and all those things yes but how do we get the otherwise we how do we get there otherwise we we it's utopian and we need a bit of you know outside sky blue skies thinking and so on but not we need concrete strategies in the here and now otherwise we're going to keep losing thank you Faisal. is it okay if uh each speaker has five minutes uh maximum to reply so we can have another round of uh, questions and answers so kai you're next yeah yeah sure um yeah i'll keep it quick uh let me just go through them in order that they were asked so harvey yeah, so this notion of like what what is uh, capitalist growth versus uh, socialist growth. I, my sense is that this debate would actually be better if neither side, degrowth, eco-modernism, Marxism, whatever, just did if they just didn't use the term growth. Like if they had to be more precise about their terms. So I because what degrowth means by growth is a series of things, right? It means material throughputs, energetic throughputs, GDP, uh, and the ideology of growth and progress. So at least those, sometimes more. But if they were precise about that and said, look, our problem is material throughputs and this is why, uh, GDP and here's why, I think we'd have a, a more concrete and a more useful conversation. Um, it would also mean that, you know, one of the things that's annoying about critiquing GDP growth is that it, GDP is kind of a uh, fetishistic form of appearance of value, right? So John Smith has done a really good job, for example, talking about the way GDP kind of disguises the role of value and price. Um, where it's created and who buy. Uh, and a Marxist kind of critique of that would be constructive. So th that kind of conversation is kind of obscured, I think, when we talk about, you know, socialist growth versus um, degrowth versions of growth. Uh, so then for me, I tend to try and think about things like human development or these like classic kind of Marxist terms of individual and collective self-actualization. Uh, and that being a project of qualitative social transformation rather than being about growth per se, right? And I, I find that more constructive. 
Um, okay, nuclear power. I mean, this is just a fraught and extremely difficult place that uh, I think uh, Kinchi did a really good job to raise some of the, the issues and concerns around this, right? So, I mean, what was it? Was the figure building 10,000 reactors, right? Which I've seen elsewhere as well, which just requires a huge amount of energy and resources. Uh, and that fundamentally, I, I don't think capital is going to do, right? I think Matt's made this point and others have too. It's the fixed capital costs are just too big. It's not going to happen. So nuclear will not be part of a uh, capitalist transition strategy. Uh, and this is a real problem and we, we need to recognize that. Um, so then I tend to just stop there at the moment. We're not in a position in the global north where we can decide whether or not to build nuclear power plants. So it's kind of neither here nor there for me sometimes. Um, but I do take the points about the dangers of nuclear energy and so on and so on. But I'll, in the interest of time, I'm just going to uh, move on. The other, I guess the other thing to say there would be rather than building those 10,000 reactors, this is where I think something useful in, in the degrowth literature applies, which is that it would be more effective and easier to reduce energy consumption in various ways that support the working class. I'll give an example. I live in England. It's shit and damp and cold, and we've got a storm outside right now. And we have terrible insulation in our housing. You know, there's been demands for this before, but retrofitting housing creates jobs. It also drives down energy costs for consumers or workers. It's it's a productive thing that I think degrowth and you know any kind of Marxism would would be on board with. So there's there's some points of shared interest there. Uh, Simon's points. So I'm glad he uses the phrase radical abundance because I get to plug that. Yeah, so I'm working on a book, co-authoring a book with the title of Radical Abundance at the moment, trying to rethink this issue of qualitative transformations instead of thinking in terms of growth. Um, Faisy, you, you raise it here, so I'll raise it too. Yeah, the, most degrowth doesn't talk about class. I totally agree. But I, what's interesting to me is that there is an emerging uh, convergence of degrowth in Marxism. Right, that uh, does talk about class and that is critiquing other parts of degrowth for not talking about class. I think we at least need to recognize that that is an important development and could lead in interesting directions. So I think that's what I hear you saying as well. Um, and you raised the question of strategy, which is fundamental. I, I, I worry that a lot of the debate on the left skips over the problem of strategy. So we have like half earth socialisms or fully automated luxury communism or whatever it is that it doesn't think about the really difficult, messy work of what kind of strategy we're going to put into place, right? Where we are to implement some kind of transition or transformation. Uh, Candy, Copper and Mega, my, I'm sorry if I've gone over five minutes. These are dense and difficult questions. Uh, Copper, yes. So, I mean, the degrowth answer to you would be the, this is an uh, argument for why we need to reduce energy use. So rather than expanding uh, the use of wind turbines rather than expanding the use of or rolling out the energy consumption used in the global north to the rest of the world and so on and so on. Uh, we need to drive down energy use and do that by things like being more efficient with how we use our energy. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, there's that. Or you do what Matt, just to turn a screw a little bit, Matt and Lee did in their recent Jacobin piece, which is allude to space mining as a way of getting energy and resources, but we're not there yet. So in lieu of that, maybe use less energy. Thanks. Okay, Kinchi, over to you. <laughs> Sorry, I've returned on my phone. Kinchi, would you like to come in now? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I agree with Megan. The whole question about nuclear power plant is to produce the, uh, is, is, closely linked with uh, producing nuclear weapons. So um, and Muto Ichio has written a very good uh, paper to talk about the building, the, the, uh, the statehood of Japan and how it was the first one in Asia to take up nuclear power, uh, even if it was being uh, uh, bombed uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So I would like Please, uh, you could uh, be uh, reading his article. So uh, I think uh, we are not to generalize on the question of um, whether we want growth or we do not want growth. I think we need to contextualize and there's no simple way of um, going back 
as if we can just go back to the uh, pre um, uh, pre World War days uh, when when uh, or pre industrial uh, revolution days. So uh, modernization is already a fact in its different forms. So we would be talking about alternative modernization. So what would that mean? Uh, uh, Kai mentioned Sami Amin. I would like to mention him as well. He's a good friend. He was a good friend and um, we had discussed a lot uh, also with John Bellamy Foster and uh, Francois Houtin. And I would like to actually bring up his uh, idea on delinking. So his uh, idea of delinking is not to go to to go isolate yourself, but then it is uh, to be um, delinked from the agenda being set in the world division of labor, especially set by the uh, the triads, the U.S., the uh, U.S., Europe, and Japan. So in the idea of delinking, then you do not subject yourself to the um, global of division of labor, which will tell you, okay, you can develop this, but and you cannot develop that. And so, so uh, for example, uh, the US has a very um, clear strategy of preventing food sovereignty in the country. So the kind of aid that US gave, that the USA gave to the uh, uh, the South Southern countries was to uh, but, uh, specifically inhibit the uh, agricultural development. So you can find many of these stories being told in Michael Hudson's book, uh, Super Imperialism. He did a very good um, analysis of the US uh, strategies on agriculture. So we that's why we see all the ABCD uh, uh, firms uh, uh, in control of agriculture today. So I feel that um, when we talk about delinking, then we should be talking about uh, re-ruralization, for example. That, uh, that, and what would we mean by re-ruralization? Re so uh, we had, uh, it, uh, then we need to be going local. There's also the ways in which we could have, uh, we could have specific um, uh, addressing specifically, specifically to the needs of the rural people in the particular region. So uh, the support of the community in finding their self-sufficiency, in finding what they need and in catering to their needs and with all the exchanges that would be possible. Uh, so I think that would be, uh, that could be certain strategies. So I think uh, saying degrowth, the word degrowth itself would create all these um, uh, images of uh, regress, images of uh, scarcity, or in, uh, of uh, well, uh, uh, sacrificing your way of uh, life and of comfort, etc. Uh, but then I think um, uh, such words uh, that then uh, that 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 is a, that applies both mostly to uh, the north. But then for many people from the south, they would say that well, you now see the question of obesity. So you see the child growing obese and you tell the child to go on diet. But now we don't, we are malnutritioned and you tell us not to grow. So I think, um, so I think we have to take into account that uh, there is this a very uneven development where there is a lot of scarcity in certain places. So we will have to say what kind of growth, what kind of alternative growth would, uh, which would not be, um, uh, taking the uh, well, taking your model from the the Western paradigms. So, what kind of growth would in fact be beneficial to the to the population? So, I think there would be the focus on food sovereignty. And uh, I was in Bhutan uh, last month, and I was there, and it was very interesting to look at some of the. The, the experiences there. They talk about gross national happiness rather than GDP. So. Why is it that we are not also taking up questions about happiness, uh, combining both material and spiritual well-being? So I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kim Chi. Matt? Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Um, in terms of what socialist growth would look, look like, I think we need to take seriously that Marx's um, analysis of capitalism as a system that basically depends on mass miseration and poverty. And that is the case 
in the global north um, as much as certainly the global south. And there's a lot of immiseration and poverty all around the world. Nearly a billion people don't have access to electricity. Over a billion people face basic uh, scarcity of water, uh, the clean potable water. There's an effort, there's a need to build just basic water sanitation systems all over the global south. So that's growth. And, and it's not, again, about it can only happen in the global south. I mean, I live in a country that has a just insane, irrational transport system based off privatized automobiles. And we're going to have to grow a public transit system to have a rational, socialist, ecological society in our country, too. So it's going to require public housing, public. And, and that. so socialist growth is is trying to address all these irrationalities of capitalism and building uh, uh, towards use value and social needs and trying to plan that in conjunction with ecological constraints. I think that's what it would look like. The nuclear power question. Um, is obviously controversial, but I think we either have to sort of sort of call the climate disaster a, a planetary emergency or not. And if it is, I think it is. If it is a planetary emergency, we have to acknowledge which, which mo what most scientific bodies have said, which is we're just going to need nuclear power in the equation because it's uh, once you build these reactors, they are zero carbon and it can take a little carbon to build them. But on balance, this is going to all scientific bodies, including the IPCC, insist that, you know, decarbonization is going to have to require more nuclear power. And, you know, one of the most successful uh, rapid examples of decarbonization we have is actually France. They took their electric sector in about 15 years and made it now 75 percent zero carbon nuclear power. You see what happens in Germany when they shut down their nuclear plants. Now they're digging up coal mines and tearing down wind farms to do so. They're they're in, and they're also importing a lot of nuclear power from France at the same time. Um, so you can have nuclear power. I don't think France is a is much of a, you know a nuclear military um, war economy, but like some countries like South Korea that have a nuclear power have literally no uh, nuclear weapons industry whatsoever. Um, so that they're not attached at the hip, as others have said. Finally, I want to talk about extraction. I think in sort of critical academia these days, there's this this sort of narrative about extraction as sort of inherently imperialist in that when we extract minerals from the global south, it's furnishing uh, a green transition in the global north, and that's going to always be exploitative. I think we need to think deeper historically about uh, uh, old school anti-colonial um, anti and socialist politics of extraction in the early to mid 20th century, which was not about necessarily uh, stopping all extraction, but taking sovereignty uh, over extraction against Western capital, right? So we have lots of examples of anti-colonial movements, the expropriation of the oil industry in Mexico in 1938, the attempt to nationalize the oil industry in Iran, um, efforts throughout the, the 1960s of countries to take sovereign control over resources to, to actually use that production to develop uh, their own national uh, development path towards a kind of socialist developmentalism. Uh, you know, I just think we've lost that history and, and, and we're starting to see countries actually do this. You, in Chile, the left-wing government is trying to nationalize their lithium reserves in Mexico and the left-wing government's trying to nationalize their lithium reserve. So again, it's not about, uh, it's really about trying to take control, trying to take power over extraction and, and directing it toward uh, human and social and ecological needs, as opposed to this, this sort of sense I get sometimes that extraction is always already inherently destructive and, and exploitative and imperial, which I don't think is the case. And there is the whole problem that, um, at least in the world economy today, if we're going to do what degrowthers say, which is degrow the global north so the global south can grow, we live in a world economy with what, what Kai described as a global division of labor, where, unfortunately, um, the global south is exporting these resources to the global north. So if you degrow that part of the world, there's a sort of fundamental disruption in those economic flows. Um, in any event, I think we need to focus a lot more on sovereignty, 
popular control over extraction and resource control in the global south. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we've got time for another round if everyone is very succinct. So we've got three questioners. Um, and so if you can all try and say, make your point in about, about three minutes, uh, I'm going to say something brief, also three minutes, and then we'll go back to the speakers. I think let's let's go in reverse order these this time with the speakers to to vary things a bit. So, okay, the first hand I see up is that of Lawrence. Yes, I will be succinct. Person, all this I I always learn from these meetings by an observation and a question. Haven't all of us humanity experienced through COVID a very brief period of a disruption to industrial production. My question here, one, is was it different in different countries, you know, in the two different phases? One before um, um, the vaccine was discovered and the one before, you know, it was common. I think we have, and we have a brief picture of it and it's not that bad. Then second question I have is often when we talk about the global north and global south, and let's accept that there is a global north, you know, this imperial, etc. I don't know the phrases. How do those of people in the global south oppose those in the global north? Because it seems to me they always have to oppose in the first place their own ruling class. I mean, today in the Guardian, it describes that you know in Ghana we, they have zero point nine three nurses per thousand of their population. And we in the global north are importing nurses from Ghana, okay? But in order to change it, they have to, if you like, challenge their own government. Secondly, on nuclear power, I'm surprised that nuclear power has is no longer universally accepted as something we shouldn't touch on the left. But Niger, in order to, you know, had to have a coup to break, um, if you like the links, I'm not showing any um, myths in the Nigerian um, government, okay? But it is up to them to say, should we continue to export uranium to France because you know our currency is tied to the French? Or should they say, we stop it? Now, of course, I could say here that you know the French government should give um, the equivalent money to Niger for all the uranium they have bought, okay? I could say that. And probably everyone will agree with me. But it seems to me it depends on not just the people, but the workers. Because when you talk about the people, I don't think the people of Britain or the people of the world, I don't mean the 40 countries, actually agree with the genocide. Let's put it to herbicide, actually the people. But these technologies are never used. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Uh, Eric, next. Yes. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry if this might like not super flow into the rest of the conversation super well. I want to ask about like a strategic self-reflection of the whole discourse that we're having. So I basically want to ask um, stuff that's like already implicit in all of the contributions of the speakers, and I would like them to reconstruct these things. So first, what are the core questions we need to ask? what are the methods we, we, uh, we use to answer them? Do we answer them, for example, mostly by um, text references onto Marxist categories, for example, or do we need to grow or, or reduce um, the productive forces? Or do we use empirical data or like mix of both, et cetera? And um, yeah, that's like always implied in every contribution, but like just getting clear, just getting to the ground of it. Okay, what do you use? How? Because I think, once we reconstruct these, we might find, okay, where does where do disagreements actually lie? Do they disagree? Do we disagree in what questions are need to be answered? Do we disagree in methods or do we disagree just in answers that we put forward? And so that also means like, okay, there's like having the self strategic self reflection onto the discourse, like what strategic role does this discourse play? What questions do we need to answer actually and which can actually be left by the wayside for now because they have like no real implications like 
practically for the moment. And also the last one, a little bit um, on the side is like, okay, we should also, I think, question the presupposition that there is like, we're always looking for like the right position or the right strategy, as if that's something that's like already given. Like, why don't we question that there is just one right combination of positions or strategies for us? Why don't we like leave it intentionally more open to have more flexibility, more possibility for alliances other than just, okay, we chart all this one way and if this doesn't work, we don't know how to react to that. Um, this is kind of like a little bit vague, I know, I'm sorry. Um, but it's always like this like very unquestioned, unquestioned presuppositions and leftist discourse on strategy is like, I think very unadvanced. Like, uh, yeah, I, yes, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Dougie. Hi, thank you very much. I've uh, loved all the contributions so far. I was very appreciative that uh, Kai raised the point of um, sort of uh, extractivist uh, aspects of the imperial mode of living, especially concerning uh, sort of the ecological dimensions of the imperial mode of living, not just these being sort of like Western workers exploiting the periphery, but actually about the sort of like externalization of ecological consequences of uh, these patterns of consumption. Um, my question is kind of linked to this, that everyone on the panel here seems to be talking about uh, some sort of socialism orientated around democratic economic planning, which sort of uh, necessitates some sort of, you know, uh, autonomy over uh, the workplace, um, but also uh, collective and global deliberation over investment and resource flows um and it kind of like leads me confused as to if we accept that there are these sort of like uh externalization of ecological consequences from uh the core outwards to the periphery why this would be democratically decided to be continued in a socialist society, why would uh, workers in the uh, imperial periphery continue to accept for sort of like conditions and ecological degradation of extractivism to enable the same consumption patterns that's going on in the imperial core? To me, that seems like an aspect that just doesn't seem to be considered. Why would this be voted upon in councils, for example. Um, surely that the uh, utilization of resources and investment, and maybe even the scaling back of the sort of like scope of extractivism would be something that would be kind of undertaken. I just don't think that that's really considered often in these sorts of debates around degrowth. Okay, thanks very much. Um... Okay, I want to say something briefly. Um, I'm very grateful to the really um, very stimulating contributions by all the speakers and indeed the people who've contributed to the Q&A. But I'm afraid I'm going to be a bit sloganistic in a, a way that Eric probably won't like. First of all, I thought Kinchi was extremely helpful in insisting that we're concrete about the forms of growth that we want and that we don't want. I think also she was absolutely right to blow the alarm whistle about uh, relying on nuclear energy as part of the green, green transition. And I, maybe I misunderstood you, Matt, but France is a, a, quite a serious new, uh, military power. Um, including including a nuclear power. So its use of nuclear energy is very much um, linked up with the aspirations of French, French imperialism. There's a good book called uh, Le Militaire by a French Marxist economist that brings this out very well. But I want to come back on some of the things that Kai said to, to, to begin with. I think it's absolutely true that the working, the world working class, is differentiated in all all sorts of sorts of ways. But I don't think it's 
And, it, and it's absolutely true that destructive forms of consumption prevail in the North and involve particularly, uh, involve at least very large sectors of the, the, the working class um, along with the along with the rest of the 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 population, that doesn't mean that workers in the north um, have an interest in sustaining the current capitalist forms of development with their very destructive consequences. And I don't just mean, you know, in the big, on the largest possible pi picture to do with. Um, climate chaos and inter-imperialist war and things things like that. I also mean things like the um, uh, obesity uh, uh, epidemic that, uh, that Kim Chi mentioned. So, um, yes, materially, workers in the North are mostly better off than workers in the South. That doesn't mean they have interest, an interest in keeping the system going. Also, the boundaries between workers in the north and workers in the south are very blur blurred now because of migration, which doesn't create, migration doesn't create an undifferentiated working class, but it can, it, it creates a working class that in all sorts of ways, if you like, extends southwards from the, from the north. Uh, from a political point of view, to appeal to people to get rid of capitalism because they need to sacrifice, I think is just hopeless. I think the value that we have to emphasize is that of solidarity. And this isn't just an empty, empty word. Fazy rightly started off talking about Palestine and the genocide that's going on there. Britain is an old imperialist country but Britain has seen an absolutely massive movement of solidarity with the with the Palestinians that has support from the mass mass of the population. So I think that's solidarity is a better way to go than appealing to sacrifice. Okay, that's all very sloganistic, but I'll stop there, and let's just um, ask these. Um, speakers to come back. As I said, I suggest we do it in reverse order. And please try to keep your remarks as close to three minutes as possible, because we're getting very close to the end of the time that we have. So starting with Matt. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Um, first to Eric, I think, you know, what are the core questions we need to be asking? I think the core one is, is as Fazy said about power and why we don't have it and why capital has all of it and how can we build power and what are our strategies to build power? Because it's power we need to, to actually take that kind of control over what we grow or what we degrow. And I think you, what you diagnose is correct that this sort of like morally pure debates over who has the right strategy or who's like most in the sort of morally correct position is evidence that a lot of our debates are not particularly consequential when it comes to building really political power. It's it's mostly about gaining influence on social media or whatever whatever the algorithm is boosting today. And it's frankly, it, it's not the messy stuff of organizing that is all about, as, as Alex just said, um, solidarity and building strategies and building mobilizations for power. And that is messy and it's not about these pure correct positions, but it is about strategy. And uh, we have to think about that. Um, I guess, uh, D Dougie, I mean, one of my main frustrations with this uh, imperial mode of living, I, I really think it dilutes the concept of imperialism. I mean, we should be clear that I think we should try to have a Marxist theory of imperialism, which I really acknowledge uh, my book doesn't do much on. And that's Kai will be thrilled to hear that that's sort of my next uh, project. I think I really want to say something more about imperialism and Marxism. And for me, the Marxist theory of imperialism has to really be about who 
who in the world have the power to organize the global order and use violence to, to, to fulfill that organization. And for me, it's not ordinary workers going to work or purchasing a hamburger, right? <laughs> These are not imperialists, right? And it's just, it dilutes the concept to, to even link imperialism to people's life, right? It just, um, and, and this theory of how the imperial mode of living externalizes the cost, again, we need to be clear here that most of the costs that are being externalized are the, the main beneficiaries of those costs are not the consumers, although they do benefit in the use value sense. It's the capitalists who, who actually make the profit off those transactions. So the ones who are actually producing the, the mining, right? The mining firm, they're externalizing costs to be more competitive in a global economy, and they're profiting off that externalization. I think James O'Connor's theory of the second contradiction of capital, how capital externalizes cost to destroy the conditions of production is a more um, useful frame here than, than looking at consumers as the ultimate externalizers, right? Okay, finally, um, Alex, yeah, that's a huge mistake on my part to, uh, obviously France is a military power. And the, the case, uh, South Korea is a little more complicated. It's, we live in a nuclear world and uh, nuclear power has connections with the nuclear industry. The only thing I want to say is that if we're going to build um, a socialist uh, society that's geared toward the production of use value, if we look away from the military applications, nuclear power, electricity wise, does have incredible use values. And I know um, Kenshi talked about energy return on energy, energy investment. Another key concept is energy density. And uh, fossil fuels are pretty pre predominant in energy density, but they're not as dense as uranium. And I mean, you get so much energy from tiny bits of uranium. You know what that means? It means less mining, less destruction of landscapes to furnish your fuel. And it also, because nuclear power plants take up so little land, as opposed to massive wind farms and solar farms, you're using way less land to produce tr uh, tremendous amounts of energy. And that's what uh, scholars call power density. How much energy can you produce per unit of space, right? And so those are really important concepts to consider. And nuclear has some advantages from a use value perspective, notwithstanding these very dire and, and dastardly connections to uh, military applications. Okay, thanks, Kinchi. Thank you. Uh, okay, so first question is, uh, in response to what Alice was saying, the people uh, will may have to sacrifice in order to get rid of uh, capitalism. I think the question is, we need to get rid of capitalism because we need to survive. This is a question of survival with the climate change, with the nuclear uh, accidents that are also um, uh, so that so it is a question of survival, whether it is for the those in the north or in the south. And um, I think we don't have to worry about uh, building ten thousand nuclear reactors because there's simply not enough uranium to do that. And um, uh, on the question of um, well, I, I started with talking about whether we have to uh, we are obliged to. Uh, choose between the uh, one of the two evils that one of them is the lesser evil that the fossil fuel or the nuclear which one is the lesser evil I don't think we uh, my, my argument is that we need to have a radical change on the question of energy that we have to think uh, that we have to we cannot say that we stick on to our current way of cons production and consumption and food uh, 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 tra transport, etc. Um, and then uh, try to see how we can have energy to meet our, uh, these needs. There has to be a radical change in the way of mode of production and in the mode of consumption. And um, and so uh, going local would be one major possibility for a reduction uh, in energy use. And I think the pandemic um, was one opportunity, although uh, it, it has its very negative um, impacts in many ways, and we are not yet out of it because we still have the viruses going around and the variants. But still, uh, during the pandemic, 95% of the planes were grounded 
people had to try to look how to have uh, go for their local food. Uh, in the lockdown in Shanghai for uh, three months, people were growing food and growing veggies in their backyard and like what they, are, they were doing in Cuba and in Venezuela uh, under the sanctions. So I think um, the way uh, it is for self survive for subsistence, for self for survival, uh, we need to focus on the question of uh, food and food sovereignty uh, in, in the face of climate change and is um, most um, urgent. And uh, just one word about um, China's uh, strategy of uh, double circulation. So China was trying to integrate itself into the global uh, scene, uh, but then with the pressures from uh, the US, so it is tried to um, uh, emphasize internal circulation. And so um, I think that is something that could be, that is not degrowth, but then it's not growing like other uh, uh, becoming imperialist powers or uh, growing like the other Western powers to extract more uh, from others and then to, to manufacture all your goods uh, and then to selling them uh, yeah, so cheaply. So the, the internal circulation uh, would be, if it had been uh, carried out more uh, forcefully, would have been um, a strategy that Samir Min would appreciate uh, in the terms of delinking. But I think uh, when we talk about uh, degrowth, we have to also see the kind of stage we are in. It's not just about uh, material production or industrial production. It is about the financialization that we are in today. So how are we addressing the question about finance and the financialization? Uh, so the last word is uh, that I, I still feel that we need to, when we talk about the growth or whatever, uh, we need to go to the communities and see how the communities can be in more control of their commons, of the um, of the means of production. And so, and I also feel that we need to really emphasize ruralization or uh, what, what, what our uh, Indian friends call um, urbanization is combining rural and urban into one word because cities are parasitic. They cannot um, sustain for themselves. And I won't talk more about uh, the nuclear issue because um, in the April issue of Monthly Review, we have an essay uh, talking about uh, the uh, reaction of the communities in Japan on the situation in Fukushima. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, Kai next. Yeah, um, I'm aware of the time, so I'm going to be <laughs> trying to be as quick as possible with some very, very big questions at the end. Uh, uh, Lawrence, you mentioned COVID-19 as a kind of a brief period of disruption. I, I just want to maybe push back a little bit and say that I think what we saw there was actually capitalism at its worst, at its most fierce in many ways, right? So, we know that the richest got richer as a result of COVID, that there were massive bailouts of large, large corporations. Uh, Robert Brennan's written about this in NLR, right? To show the massive redistribution of wealth. And then the way that PPE and vaccinations were rolled out across the world was extremely uneven and perpetuated. You know, all kind of, I, I think we all agree with that here. I just want to emphasize that it wasn't exactly, you know, a suspension. In fact, we saw some parts of capital get, you know, considerably worse. Um, Eric, Eric, your questions are massive. <laughs> They're really good. Um, one of the things that you raise, I want to just touch on, I think, is this idea of what are the methods? Uh, and you you say, like, you know, is it theory or is it empirics? Uh, surely it has to be a combination of both theory and empirics, theory and practice. This is the classic Marxist point. And that it cannot be an appeal to authority, which I worry is something that happens very often. So Sato, for example, this idea of finding a kind of degrowth version of Marx and late Marx, I think it would be better if you just said, here's my proposal for degrowth Marxism, like, uh, instead of claiming to have found it in Marx, you know, by reading selectively through a certain kind of Marx, just come up with a theory yourself and present it and make the case based on the world we live in. I think that has to be the method that that is a Marxist method, right? I think, I think that's the way forward. Uh, da, 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 I've got a few notes here. Why not more open? Well, okay, maybe I'm old school, but I, I think debate's important. I think the way, if you hold a position firmly and argue it forcefully, but you are responsive to critiques and challenges and open and receptive in that way, maybe this is what you're asking for, rather than just entrenching ourselves in opposition, but being flexible and listening to others. That's how debate and conversation moves forward, right? So there's a space for polemics, I think, on in, in a kind of a Marxist discourse for that reason. 
Um, why would workers in the periphery continue to accept the conditions that they're in if they if we had global planning? I, Dougie, I think like the answer is that they just they just wouldn't. Um, it seems quite straightforward to me. Then the imperial mode of living is not a term that I use. It's not one that I find especially useful either. I think Matt's right that the primary beneficiaries are capitalists, or more accurately, capital, right, as an impersonal force. Um, and I just, yeah, the imperial mode of living maybe does place the emphasis a bit too much on, on consumption for me. Alex. Okay, so I use sacrifice in jest, right, in a kind of like scare quotey way, but I do think you're being a little bit too simplistic about working class interests in the global north. And I'll, I'll give some examples. So the AFL CIO famously supporting the Vietnam War, or until recently supporting, you know, being pro-Israel, right, as opposed to <laughs> arms manufacture and sale. Just down the road from me, there's Samuelsbury, which is where they're producing part of the fuel silage for the F-35 that is bombing Palestine. When people go and protest outside of there, workers go and protest outside of there, other workers get angry and annoyed. They have an interest, in a, unless you're going to say that they somehow don't know their own interests, they have an interest in that job. And so I think it's not as simplistic as saying, you know, that they don't, it's more conflicted, more variegated is what I'm saying. Or when I, I did work previously on oil and gas extraction in Pennsylvania, where workers had a material interest in oil and gas expansion in Pennsylvania because they needed jobs. I think that's right. I think our task is to compose a different kind of consciousness uh, that recognizes that their needs can be met better outside of capital than they can within capital. And I think we'd probably agree on that, right? That a better form of living, a better way of living is possible. But that doesn't mean that they aren't in complicated ways entangled uh, in capital circuits of accumulation. And I think we have to face up to that and work to unravel that through our struggles, right? So yeah, I'd, I'd probably end it there. Thanks very much, Faisy. Yes. Um, With the last word. Thank you. Um, yes, um, it's true on the on the COVID question. Uh, there was, you know, huge transfer of wealth, corruption, uh, and so on. But I think the the period of COVID also showed that people were willing to change their lifestyles in a in a big way. Um, the governments that governments were 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 of course capable of taking charge of things in in this emergency period. You know, lockdowns were imposed, yes, but they but there was a sense of organization to it. There was an incentive because of the because of the um, the, the the virus. It, in a way, it was also a kind of tiny glimpse of what was possible as well. In in a in a a, um, a radical shifting of things in a very short space of time. I mean, this government was paying people to stay home from work. I mean, you know, it's just a it it, it was a sort of glimpse of a, a of a of a of a different um, kind. And of course, we we need to there there will be incentives. There are incentives um, objectively around around a better life. I mean, you know, you retrofit your home and you have lower bills. You know, that's an incentive. But we need Again, it always comes back to this question. The real contention is how do we force in the immediate a government to do that? Um, and of course, in the long term, um, taking power in order to do that. I mean, that of course, taking power is an abstract question at this point, but but you know, how do we how do we force that um that situation? I mean, I like the question of um, you know, this, the 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 strategic re self-reflection on on the discussion. I mean, what are the core questions to ask? I think I think we've been asking them in a way. What is the strategy for winning popular power? And again, the climate question is is central to that. But but in a way, it's it's you know, the the climate question is is so big. We have to we you know confronting the capitalist question is 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 what we need in the immediate and then immediately the, the the next question is who is the agent to do that who is going to do that it won't be the capitalist class it won't be um you know the middle class could go either way um but it, you know it doesn't mean i think that you know trying to convince the capitalist class of this or that is 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 a total waste of time but 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 yes we have to put that kind of pressure um on but we also, at the same time, have to um, take things into our own hands. And I think a lot of the left has has forgotten this idea, almost embraced this, this, this Gortzian idea of farewell to the working class. What happened to that? I thought that was a Marxist, uh, um, you know, the, the, the kernel of Marxism, as in 
the agent is is the working class. I, I know that people have criticized it for being, um, you know, uh, hyper workerist and uh, and so on. I still think um, it is they they are the vast majority of people in society. What methods? Yes, of course, it has to be a a, a combination of empirical and and uh, so on. But also, I think the all of these questions are much more political than technical. I think the technical can be worked out if the political question can be um, can be the focus. And you know having a, a total picture of the world. So yes, while I, while I think that the distinction between the global North and South is one we, we, we have to make, we also have, have to look at the totality. We have to look at history, which I think um, you know much of the left uh, is doing, but we also have to look at agency. And I'm surprised that, you know, Koei Saito has written a, written a whole book in which Lukács is, is central, but hasn't understood these questions about uh, totality, um, and, and, and agency in, in particular. And here I think finally, uh, Alex is right about interests. I mean, workers in the global North don't benefit in the sense that a capitalist benefits from profit. They don't have that kind of interest in, in continuing things as they are. Those workers who will say, well, it's my job and so on, um, you know, that that's a product of alienation. That's a product of, 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 of being, you know, influenced by capitalist ideology, it doesn't mean that they have an interest. So, just to say, I, I, I think finally we do have to focus on these, um, on these questions of strategy. They are political questions, and um, the question of who uh, takes this forward is is absolutely crucial. And um, I look forward to engaging um, uh, with you all on these questions. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much to everyone. I mean, including the many, many contributors to the chat um, who, who, who have collectively, the speakers, people who ask questions and the people who contributed to the chat, um, uh, created a really fascinating discussion that leaves lots of questions open and unresolved, but plenty to, plenty to think about. So I'd like to thank everyone but particularly the speakers and particularly again again kinchi for staying up so late um and making this this just a, a a great seminar so thank you very much to you all and um uh see you again i hope at uh, in our forthcoming seminars thank you then Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Alex, for chatting. Diego, can we save the, the chat? Maybe they work with a lot of interesting links. Yeah, the chat was great. <laughs>